Uh, to give you an example, a researcher at the BBC working on a Robert Pesson documentary went to the Bank of England and said, can you give me a, you know, a, a guide to how money is created? And they just said, no. This documentary will investigate and explain this ever-changing system and the impact it has, both on a national and international level. In 1948, notes and coins constituted 17% of the total money supply. This was one contributing factor in the government's ability to finance post-war reconstruction. This included the establishment of the NHS. In only 60 years, notes and coins have shrunk to less than 3%. Now, over time, these paper notes became as good as money. People would use the paper notes instead of going and getting the real money from the bank. And obviously, as soon as the banks realised that what they were creating had become you know, the dominant type of money in the economy, they realised that by, by creating more of it, they could generate profits. You know, they can just print up some new notes, lend it, and get the interest on top of that. And they did that, you know, up until the 1840s. In the 1840s, they pushed it just a little bit too far. And that caused inflation, it destabilised the economy. So in 1844, the Conservative government of Robert Peel actually passed a law that took the power to create money away from the commercial banks um, and brought it back to the state. So since then, the Bank of England has been the only organisation authorised to, to create paper notes. Since then, everything's gone digital. And what we now use as money is the digital numbers that commercial banks can create out of nothing. I think a lot of people in the UK probably think that the government or the central bank um, is, is in control of most, most money in circulation and issues new money into circulation, but that's uh, not the case. It's private banks that create the vast majority of new money in circulation and also decide uh, how it's allocated. The official terminology for this accounting entry is commercial bank money. When banks issue loans to the public, they create new commercial bank money. When a customer repays a loan, commercial bank money is destroyed. The banks keep the interest as profit. There's a lot of misconceptions about the way banks work. There was a, a poll done by the Cobden Centre where they asked people you know, how, how they thought banks actually operated. Around 30% of the public think that when you put your money into the bank, it just stays there and it's safe. And you can understand why, because you know, every, every child has a piggy bank where you keep putting money in, and then when it's a rainy day, you smash it and you take that money out and you spend it. So a lot of people f keep this, this idea of banking, you know, it's somewhere safe to keep your money so that it's there for whenever you need it. Um, another, the other 60% of people assume that when you put your money in, that money's then being moved across to somebody who wants to borrow it. So you have a pensioner who keeps saving money her whole entire life, and then her life savings have been lent to some you know, young people who want to buy a house. But actually, banks don't work like that. A few economists will realize the way the money system works, but if you don't, if you don't realize the way that money works and you think that you know, everybody saving is going to work well for the economy. What really happens, once you understand the way the money system works, is that if everybody starts saving, uh, the amount of money in the economy shrinks and we have a recession. So most economists don't have this, this full picture. They don't understand all elements of the system. They rely on uh, assumptions, on, you know, received knowledge, without actually going into the details. And you know, money is, money is the centre of the economy. If you don't understand where it comes from, who, it creates, who creates it, and when it gets created, then how can you understand the entire economy? When the vast majority of money that we use now is not cash, but it's electronic money, then whoever's creating the electronic money is getting the proceeds of creating that money. And obviously, creating electronic money is much more profitable than creating cash, because you don't have any production costs at all. So while we've got 18 billion over the course of a decade in profit from creating cash, the banks have actually created 1.2 trillion pounds.
By 2008, the outstanding loan portfolio of bank-created credit, also known as commercial bank money, stood at over £2 trillion. As recently as 1982, the ratio of notes and coins to bank deposits was 1 to 12. By 2010, the ratio had risen to 1 to 37. That is, for every pound of treasury-created money, there was £37 pounds of bank-created money. In the 10 years prior to the 2007 crisis, the UK commercial bank money supply expanded by between 7 to 10% every year. A growth rate of 7% is the equivalent of doubling the money supply every 10 years. The amount of money that they're creating out of nothing is just incredible. 1.2 trillion in the last 10 years. Um, and there's, that money has been distributed according to the priorities of the banking sector. You know, not the priorities of society. Bank sector itself grew from 1980 2.5 trillion dollars to 40 trillion dollars by assets. In 1980, global bank assets were worth 20 times the then global economy. By 2006, they were worth 75 times, according to the UN. As the following chart shows, total bank assets of UK banks as a percentage of GDP remain relatively stable at 50 to 60 percent up to the end of the 1960s. After that, they shot up dramatically. And the real money in, in the world uh, to be made today is not by producing anything at all, it's simply by forms of speculating, basically making money from money. Uh, that's the most profitable and, and by far and away um, the, the biggest form of, of, of activity, of economic activity that exists in the world today. Today, banks are no longer restricted by how much they can lend, and as such, how much new credit they can create out of nothing. They are restricted solely by their own willingness to lend. The issue with allowing banks to create money, uh, there's two main issues. Firstly, the fact that they create this money when they make loans. So it guarantees that you know, we have to borrow all our money for the economy from the banks. As such, to have a healthy growing economy, the government needs to put in place strategies to allow for ever-increasing debt. The only way the government can create additional purchasing power is by getting itself and us into more debt. The second big issue with allowing banks to create money is that they have the incentive to always create more. You know, they create more money if they issue a loan they get the bonuses and the commissions and the incentives to create, you know, to lend as much as possible. You have to develop a sales culture. What did they do? They recruited an amazing guy, lovely guy, Andy Hornby, who came from Asda, to turn the bank into a supermarket retailing operation. If you trust bankers to control the money supply, the money supply will just grow and grow and grow, as will the level of debt, until the point where it crashes. You know, when some people can't repay the debt, and then they'll stop lending. You hear politicians and journalists saying, you know, we've, we've been living beyond our means, we've become dependent on debt, we need to rein in our spending and live within our means. Um, it's not possible in the current system. You know, the reason why everybody's in debt now is not because they've been recklessly borrowing. Um, we haven't borrowed all this money from, you know, an army of pensioners who've been saving up their whole, whole lives. Money in the current system is debt. You know, it's created when banks make loans. So the only way in the current system that we can have any money in the economy, you know, the only way we can have money for business to trade is if we've borrowed it all from the banks. When I see David Cameron talking about how um, we need an economy not based on debt, but we need an economy based on savings, he just doesn't know what he's saying. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely absurd. And it shows his complete lack of understanding of how our money system actually works. What he's essentially saying is that we need an economy with no money. If everyone was saving, we'd have mass disappearing of money, which is essentially what a bank write-off is, essentially, is people defaulting on their debt, which, which essentially is just money disappearing. But if people weren't taking on the debt, then it's just, it's just such a joke, it's such an uh, uh, amateur understanding of how our economy works and how the monetary system works 
and how money is actually created. So um, I really do get a laugh out of watching what people are actually saying. And they're all just regurgitating what they've learned off each other. And you just hear the same things. And it just makes me, it, it really gets on my nerves when I hear people talking about, um, yeah, we need more regulations. We need to regulate the way banks are actually, and the bonus, it's all just one big smoke screen and working on all the symptoms of a greater disease, which is really, you need to look at the, the money system, the way money is created. And uh, if we don't want any debt, then we're essentially saying we don't want any money and we want a moneyless economy with the exception of the 3% that's created debt free. This is the boom bust cycle. And I've said before, Mr. Deputy Speaker, no return to boom and bust. Yeah. Net bank lending must forever increase. We're paying interest on every single pound. Even if, even if you think the money belongs to you, somebody somewhere is paying interest on that money. The banking system has such a huge impact on the world, but only because it supplies our nation's money supply. We have to protect them, we have to subsidise them. We have to allow them to continue because the, the disaster of, of a, a bank collapse affects us all in a huge way and anyone that says that we shouldn't have bailed out the banks doesn't quite understand the, the, the nature of our monetary system. That's like eliminating a, a huge chunk of our money but also bailing out the banks is perpetuating a system which is never going to work anyway. So whatever we do we're always going to have this cycle until we separate how money is created and the activities of banking. Then the banks can do as they wish. They're a normal business like everyone else. There are millions of people across the country, all transferring money to each other, using only a few major banks. These banks can keep a tally on their computer systems, and usually many of the movements cancel each other out at the end of the day. The five major banks, RBS, Lloyds, HSBC, Barclays and Santander, hold over 85% of all deposits. As there are a limited number of banks in the system, the central reserve money can only be moved around them in a closed loop. The money is just circulating through the system over and over again. And if you think about it, a one pound coin could be used to make a billion pounds of payments if it was circulated a billion times. And that's effectively the system that you have now, is you have a small pool of real money that's just going round and round the system. And it's been used to make a, a huge quantity of payments on our behalf. Just before the crisis, there was only £20 billion pounds in the accounts at the central bank. This is George. George worked in a big bank in the city of London. But one day, without warning, George's bank went bust. Luckily, the government rescued the bank and George kept his job. But the greedy government wanted something in return for their help. They demanded a higher tax on George's salary and bonus. For someone with a high-cost lifestyle like George, a shock like this can be devastating. Now George struggles to afford the rent on his Riverside apartment in central London. The tyres on his Aston Martin are wearing thin and are barely road legal. Unless George's situation improves, or unless someone like you helps him, then George may even be forced to walk past the next Savile Row tailors and buy his suit from Topshop or Next. Even if George had anything to celebrate, he can no longer afford the champagne to celebrate with. George is not alone. Countless others are suffering like him, and no one knows how long it'll be until the good times return. With your help, George can turn his life around. A simple monthly donation from you can bring a bit of sunshine back to George's life. Just £395 will help him celebrate minor achievements with a magnum of crystal champagne. As little as £900 will help George buy a new set of tyres for his Aston Martin. £2,000 can help George recover his self-esteem with a suit from a prestigious Savile Row tailor. 
even a small amount will help. Just 200 pounds will buy a meal for George and his girlfriend experience. Just 200 pounds extra will buy the drinks. By adopting a banker, you won't just be supporting someone like George in a time of need. You'll also be supporting the trendy wine bars of the City of London, the luxury car makers of Italy, and the tailors of Savile Row. You'll be doing your patriotic duty to support Britain's greatest industry in its time of need. And when the good times return and George gets his bonus back, the taxes he pays will help fund the public services that the rest of you scroungers depend on. So please, until the good times return for George and those like him, will you give today?